Hi guys! Usually my workouts involve lifting weights at the gym, but with this lockdown I haven't been able to go, so what I've been doing instead is high intensity interval training, which involves doing short exercises with short rests in between them. It's a great way to do exercise quickly, but it's very intense. But to help with that I needed a simple timer that can switch between exercise and rest mode to help me keep track of the workouts. So I figured that since I'm a coder, I might as well build one, so let me take you along for a ride. I want to build something very simple that I can use for my workout just tomorrow. In its most basic form, I need a countdown timer that changes between exercise and rest mode. And I need to be able to decide how many exercises I'm going to do as well. Now that it's clear what the app needs to do, the first step is to come up with a design. At an early stage of development, I like to come up with the simplest design I can. And call me old school, but nothing beats pen and paper when I'm coming up with ideas. So for me, the first thing is to get out the notebook and start thinking about, as a user, what I'd like to be able to do with the app. This user-first thinking might seem obvious, but often developers skip that part entirely and we start off by thinking of what code we're going to write. The key with any software project is to start small. Start simple, start with few features and then add more later on. If you start off with something too complicated, you're going to struggle to complete really anything and then you're going to lose motivation very quickly. With everything planned on paper, we move on to the pixel perfect design. Although I can't call myself a designer, so nothing here is going to be a masterpiece. Since this app is meant to be used while exercising outside probably, I went for a mobile first approach. On Figma, we can create an iPhone X artboard and then bring in the Safari UI elements so that we end up with the canvas that will be visible by users of our site. Whenever I'm starting a project, I'll often look at Google Fonts for inspiration on what free fonts I can use. And here I'm going with Lato since it's got a good set of weights and the overall aesthetic is simple but readable. Then we're on to recreating the paper design using Figma. I'm starting off with placing the elements using a fixed set of font sizes. Deciding on a small set of font sizes you're going to use in a project is a good starting point so that it won't get too messy. There are a lot of ways to show progress. A progress bar is probably the simplest way. We could make a progress circle and I did experiment with that but while deciding that is not too difficult, coding it is a bit trickier. That's why I went with the progress bar. I decided to go with a different color when doing a rest versus when doing an exercise so that it's easier for users to see at which stage they are right now. Next up we have to design the form that will let users tell us how long exercises and rests will be as well as how many exercises they want to perform. You can go all sorts of crazy with form design, but to keep it simple I went with a three column approach. One for labels, one for fields, and a third one for the units if they're required to give the users a bit more information. Finally I made a button to start the workout that is centered on the page. After designing this, the next step is to code the main structure of the page using HTML and to style it with CSS. But before that, we need to understand the structure of the site we're building. Here the site is quite simple. We've got a header with the logo. Then we've got the current mode, which can be welcome, rest or go. Then we've got the timer and underneath it the progress bar. And you can see that all of these are blocks. They occupy 100% of the width of the screen. So they all appear stacked one on top of another. Then in the home screen we've got the form with one label and field and unit per row and you can see these are laid out like a table. And finally there's the button to start this session. By deciding which elements go inside which and which elements contain the visible parts of the site like text or buttons and so on, you can build up the site structure. A well crafted HTML structure then makes it really easy to add styling with CSS so that the end result looks like the original designs. With this decided, I could go into the code editor and start working on recreating this designed HTML structure in code. I'll start off by creating an HTML file and also a CSS file for later. And since we're not working with Python and Flask just yet, I can simply open this HTML file with the browser and it will render whatever HTML code is in it. So I'll go ahead and code the different elements we decided earlier. I'll start off with the title of the page that shows up in the browser tab and I'll also link the CSS file by using a link tag and set some viewport metadata that handles setting the appropriate scale level when viewing the site on a mobile device. Then we move on to the body. I'll create each of the main components we saw earlier, starting with the header and logo contents. Then we've got a main component which is used in HTML to place the, well, the main content of the site and inside it I'll put the setup heading, the timer showing zero seconds to begin with and the progress bar. 
I'm putting some default values in here for the progress bar, but it doesn't really matter what we put in here as long as the maximum value and the current value match so that the progress bar shows up as full. That doesn't look very good yet, but we still need to work on the CSS styling in just a moment. Let's work on the form first, though. I'm going to create a form and inside it place elements one by one. I'm actually not going to put them into sub-containers that we discussed earlier at this point, because the styling method we'll use, CSS Grid, will actually work better without them. For each form element, I'm creating a label, an input for the user to type into, and the unit text where necessary, and those go into span tags. Note that throughout all of this, I'm giving some of these elements classes. Those will be used by CSS later to target the elements for styling. After adding every form element, we can also add a button. This could be an input with type of submit or a button with type of submit. Either way, as long as this element is inside the form, it will submit the form and send data away when the button is clicked. On the web, we use CSS for styling, and that really means anything that doesn't define the structure and content of the site. For this site, most of the CSS changes we need to make are to do with spacing and size, space between elements, and things like size of the elements in terms of width and height and so on. So I'm going to go into the CSS file and add some initial code that we need. By doing this, we're telling every element to use the border box method of sizing. If you're not familiar with border box and the CSS box model, let me know. I might create a video on that later on. We're also changing the font family to be Lato if it's available, Helvetica if that's not available, and finally the default sans serif font of the operating system if neither of those are available. Then we can move on to each element of the page. Starting at the top, we'll begin with the header. We'll set the background color, font weight, and text color, and also add some padding and margin to separate these elements from others. Inside of the header, we've got the header logo, and we're also setting the font size in there. Then we can work on the setup text. We're going to change the display mode to block so that it takes up 100% of the page width, change the font size, align the text, and add some margins. Adding a text transform of uppercase also change all the text to uppercase so that we don't have to do that in the HTML code. Then we can work on the timer. We're also changing the font size here to make it much bigger than the rest of the text, aligning the text in the center, and also adding a small margin. Then we can move on to the main body of content. And I'm going to forget for now about laying this form as a table to simplify things. We'll start off just worrying about sizes, font sizes, the width of the form, border radius, and changing our inputs, as well as setting the font for our labels, as well as the text alignment. Then we'll also work on the button styles. I'll change the font size, add some padding to separate the borders of the button from the text inside it, and also change the colors and the pointer. Setting cursor to pointer means that whenever we hover over the button, the cursor will change to a small hand that suggests the button is clickable. Then we'll also add a hover animation that changes the background color slightly to indicate that the button is active. Adding a transition property on the button allows us to change the background color over time, which is a nice touch. Then we can work on the progress bar, which does require a bit more work. We're setting the width to 80% so that it doesn't go edge to edge, that would look a bit weird. And we're also adding some margins. The border also allows us to produce an outline outside the element. Then using specific classes, we can set the background color of the progress bar at different stages. By default, it's going to be white, but if we're currently doing an exercise, then we'll assign the progress dash dash set class. We're going to set the background color to red. And if we're in a rest mode, we'll put the progress dash dash rest class on the progress bar and we'll set the background color to this green. We're using the WebKit and Moz selectors to target the progress bar in different browsers. Different browsers create and handle progress bars differently, which is why we need that. Finally, what's left is the main body of content and the form. This was a bit trickier because I designed the form to look a bit like a table. So we're going to use CSS Grid, which allows us to lay out elements as if they were on a table. I defined three columns, all the same size, and placed the input elements inside it. To create a grid container, I just gave the form the display grid property, and then I defined the different columns that will be in the grid. Using the column templates, we can define three columns of equal width with one FR, one FR, one FR, and I also defined the gaps between rows and columns. Aligning the items to the center means that every row item will be centered vertically within its row. When creating the button container, I'll make it justify its contents so that the button is centered horizontally. 
And with that, our CSS is complete. If we refresh the page, everything is where it should be. So we can go ahead and create the rest and exercise pages as well. Now that we're here, it's mostly a copy paste job with a few small changes to the CSS classes. So now we've got three files. We're ready to start shrinking the progress bar and changing the countdown timer one second at a time. However, in order to do that, we need JavaScript. And in order to navigate from page to page and share data between pages, we're going to use Python and Flask. But I know this video is getting a bit long, so we're going to tackle that next week instead. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button and the bell. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram to get more updates and behind the scenes. Everything that we've talked about in this video, including the code that we've written so far, is linked down in the description below, so feel free to check it out and play around with it. All right, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next week.